All right, here we are again, guys. Um, last time we talked about cache and internal controls, and I want to go over just a few of the principles that we talked about last time, just to give you a little bit of review. So let's look at the PowerPoints real quick, if we could. Um, we talked about what the purpose of internal control is. It's to protect your assets. But it's also to ensure reliable accounting and promote efficiency in your operations. I don't want you to think internal control is all about just catching thieves, okay? It is about having a policies and procedures in place to help things be smooth, to help them be efficient, to help them be reliable. And help prevent mistakes as well, Pre prevent honest mistakes. Wants to give you policies to, uh, that you can follow, okay? All right. Um, the next slide, okay. There we go. Hung up there for a second. Okay, the principles of internal control. Remember, you wanted to establish responsibility. Who is supposed to do what, okay? Uh, maintain adequate records that support the journal entries uh, that you make. You want to insure assets and you want to bond your key employees. You want to separate your record keeping from your custody of assets. This is a big one. If you have custody of assets, whether it's cash or warehouse items or whatever, you should not be able to do record keeping and journal entries for those. Otherwise, you could steal the asset and just make a journal entry, couldn't you? You need to divide responsibility for related transactions, spread it over a number of people, if possible. You want to apply technological controls, such as cash registers, um, cameras in some situations. You want to perform regular and independent reviews. You want to check people's work, right? Okay. All right. Now, what I would like to do now is um, I want to show you two quick little videos. These are two news stories, and uh, I'm going to lean up so you can hear this. Okay. Uh, hopefully, we can make this work. So these are about a minute and a half each. All right. Um, and these are just two I found when I was looking on YouTube this morning. Okay, so let's go ahead and play these and we'll try to make this work, okay? Guilty to stealing nearly $20 million from the company. A Melbourne court has heard that she contributed to the company's collapse even though most of the money has been recovered because she spent it on real estate. James Bennett reports. Sonia Corza had been Clive Peters' payroll manager for just three months when she discovered a loophole in the company's accounting practices. Between 2007 and 2009, the 39-year-old from Lilydale stole $19.3 million from her employer, telling police it was easy. Today, she pleaded guilty in the Supreme Court to 24 counts of theft. Sonia Corza used the money to buy around 60 properties across Melbourne as well as in Tasmania and Queensland. She also spent $110,000 on a car for herself, $80,000 on wine for her husband, and another $17,000 on jewellery and shoes. Causa's lawyer, Con Haliotis, said his client's actions weren't motivated by a desire to fund a lavish lifestyle, explaining that she'd become obsessed with the process of buying and selling houses. When her employer discovered the discrepancies in August last year, she had 44 houses in her name. All but one of them has now been sold and more than 16 million has been recovered. Prosecutor Peter Kidd argued her actions had contributed to the company's collapse. It went into receivership in May this year and is now in administration. The court heard Miss Causa's obsession with property was her way of dealing with a failing marriage and the stress of caring for two autistic children and that she had a delusional belief she was exceptionally good at investing in property. Psychologist Jeffrey Cummins told the court Miss Causa knew her actions were out of control and was relieved to have been caught. Sonia Causa will be sentenced in two weeks. Okay, couple points from that. Number one, she stole 20 million, they recovered most of it, 16 or 17 million, but they're still short 3 million, right? It's a bad day at the office, isn't it? Secondly, you can see all of the things that were in place. Uh, she had some sort of stress in her life. She had an autistic child and a failing marriage. She probably used those two things to rationalize what she was doing. 
and she said it was easy. It was easy, okay? There was the opportunity. So you had the rationalization, the opportunity, and some sort of financial distress, which are the three things that we find in almost every incident of stolen assets from a company, all right? She didn't have any criminal record before this. She was relieved to be caught. This is a classic case, right? Okay. Um, let me show you one other one, and then we'll, we'll talk through the rest. This one's a little bit more of an extreme example. All right. New details have emerged about an accountant who killed himself after being questioned by police about the disappearance of two of his clients. Dennis Gerwing's former employer says he embezzled more than $2 million from several companies over a four-year period. Company officials won't say how much money was taken from John and Elizabeth Calvert. They've also refused to speculate on whether the couple had discovered the theft. The Calverts manage property on Hilton Head, and the club group has been keeping their books. They were in the process of doing their own accounting, and Gerwing was working out the details. Police say he was the last person to see them together. There's been no sign of the couple since early March. Ross Simpson, the Associated Press. Okay, a little bit more of an extreme example, unfortunately. People died in that one, right? I don't know if anybody saw the 60 Minutes. Did anybody see 60 Minutes last night? It's a really good story. It was an interview with the Madoffs. You know who the Madoffs are? Mm -hmm. Bernie Madoff, largest Ponzi scheme ever in the history of the world. And they interviewed his wife, uh, his son. Uh, and the, his other son actually committed suicide. Um, but it was a very sad deal. But it was, again, it was like, you know, they interviewed this, this wife and whether you believe it or not, whether she knew about it or not. But it's like, did, uh, it's like, how do you steal this much money? It always starts so little, doesn't it? It starts so little, and then it just gets more. And finally, you realize you're in it so deep, you just, you just go nuts. Or you get, you get hooked on it, or you have to steal to cover up what you stole before. But a lot of these stories are similar. At the end, they just say, I don't know how this happened. Okay? I don't know how this happened. It was very interesting. If you go to 60 Minutes and type in, or if you go to the Google and type in 60 Minutes interview with Madoffs, you can probably watch it. I think, there's, I think they have their interviews in their entirety on their, on their website. But I could, we, we could spend all morning watching uh, news stories about accountants who have done these sort of things, right? Okay. And but that's just a couple of them. Now going back to the powerpoints, let's talk a little bit more about internal control, and then we'll go through our uh, homework. All right. Now, technology has changed internal control. In some ways, it's made it easier. In some ways, it's added some challenges. Um, there's reduced processing errors for sure. What do we mean by that? Well, I'll tell you. Every company uses computer software. I, I don't want to say every, but almost every. 99.999% of companies use some sort of computer software to keep track of their accounting. You can buy a good package for less than a couple hundred bucks. Okay? Now, it will not let you post a journal entry without your debits equaling your credits. Okay? When people did this by hand, they would often make a mistake or a transposition error, and their debits would not equal their credits. On paper, it couldn't be caught, but with technology and computers, that stuff is prevented. Okay? Another thing is, is uh, it'll add up columns of, of numbers, and you know, if you create spreadsheets and reports, it'll, it, the numbers will, will be calculated and then flow through. And, and so there's a lot of that sort of just addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, that there, there's been big improvements on just having technology. Okay? Now, one thing though that technology has also done though is it's increased the e-commerce, right? Um, have you guys, how many here have ever bought anything uh, off of the computer? Raise your hand. Almost everybody? Okay, if I had asked that 15 years ago, I don't know if anybody would have answered it. 
Has anybody ever bought anything internationally? Anybody? Okay. A few of you? Okay. Again, if I'd asked that 10 years ago, probably not. But now it, there's a whole new, um, whole new opportunity of commerce, but there's a whole, bun a whole bunch of new challenges as well. Correct? A whole bunch of new challenges as well. Um, technology, a good thing about it, another good thing about it is it allows more extensive testing of our records. Okay? We can go through a lot, a lot of our records more efficiently than if we were having to thumb through paper and add it up our, uh, manually. Um, one challenge is, though, that the separation of duties has become um, a, a tougher thing to overcome. Now, here's the good news and the bad news as far as technology and accounting jobs. Technology has, has gotten rid of some accounting jobs. Okay? Maybe at a company where there used to be 10 accountants, now there's only seven. Okay? Because technology does a lot of the things that used to be done by people. That's the bad news. The good news is, is the jobs that they eliminate, that, that technology eliminated, were largely the really, really boring jobs. Okay? The sort of jobs that you guys don't want to aspire to anyway. You know, just banging on numbers and stuff like that. There's still a great need for accountants and interpreting this data. You have to tell the computers what to do. And, you know, there is no substitute, at least as of right now, for a good, strong accountant. Okay? As a matter of fact, a lot of times when I go into my clients, when I do consulting, you know how they say a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing? Sometimes these, these accounting software, it can allow them to do a lot of stuff that you're going, I wish you wouldn't have done that, you know? And maybe they feel the power or the knowledge to do things that they didn't really understand, okay? But technology has affected the number of accountants out there. There is no doubt, okay? But jobs are still very plentiful, okay? Um, there are limitations of internal control, okay? And I think I said, I ca you cannot devise a system that is 100% safe. Just like I think I said the other day, I can't devise a system where there is absolutely guaranteed no way to cheat on my test, right? It, it, you know, I just can't. But I can certainly make it a lot more difficult and eliminate most of it. Um, but, but understand, too, there are times that people make errors. Maybe they're tired or they're confused, okay? And, you know, people will make errors. That doesn't necessarily mean they're thieves and they're stealing from the company. I mean, we all make mistakes, right? Okay? We all make mistakes. Maybe they don't understand what they're doing, okay? Maybe they, don't, maybe they had a teacher who gave take-home tests, okay, and didn't care about them, okay? That's why I don't give you guys take-home tests, okay? But there also can be situations when there is human fraud. And let me tell you, it is very difficult. You can divide up responsibilities and separate record keeping from custody of assets, but it is very dip difficult if two or three people collude to steal from you. You know what that means? That means two or three people that work for me say, hey, let's steal from Krug. Well, you know, a lot of you are checks and balances on each other, and if you all want to steal, decide to steal from me, that's very, very hard to prevent, isn't it? Okay? That's why a lot of companies have rules against, I'm not going to hire family members. I'm not going to hire your boyfriend. I'm not going to hire your sister. You see what I'm saying? Because they don't want those relationships. Okay? Um, a couple of other things, uh, oops, sorry, is we have to do a cost-benefit analysis of internal control. There are some things that the benefits simply don't outweigh the costs. And let me give you the, an example I always use. I used to work at a company where there was a refrigerator with cans of pop that they bought from Costco. And uh, they used that instead of a pop machine. There was only a dozen of us working there. Well, when you took a can of pop, what you were supposed to do is put a quarter in their little, little can, you know. Take a pop, you put a quarter in. Well, do you think people ever took pop without putting a quarter in? Yeah. We, we were always short about 20 bucks every, at the end of each month. What are you going to do? You're going to hire a security guard or put cameras there? Or are you just going to say, hey, we're going to always be short about 20 bucks? Okay? 
my boss would always complain about it. Sometimes I'd put a $10 bill in there just to say, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> just to alleviate the, the pain a little bit. But, you know, you're going to lose a little money, right? Somebody told me about they, uh, they worked at a restaurant, and I was asking them if people ever stole assets from the company, from the restaurant. And the, and this, the, the student was saying, yeah, every now and then a, a cook will take a couple chicken tenders in the back room and eat them. You know? Anybody here ever worked at a restaurant? Anybody here? Anybody ever steal, you know, take some food that, put some food in their mouth that they shouldn't? Okay. Okay. Well, things like that happen. Probably not worth even worrying about it too much. Okay. You're probably not going to go bankrupt because a cook ate a couple chicken tenders that they didn't pay for. The things that we want to avoid and the things that are worth putting in these procedures in are the things that there could be a lot of potential loss. Make sense? We, got, we have to do a cost-benefit analysis on it. Okay? All right. Let's take a look at the homework real quick. I think I assigned a couple exercises to think through, didn't I? Let's look through those. Okay? Now, when we go through these, do what I always do. And I, I think I told you this the other day. Um, whenever I go to a restaurant or something, um, I'll always go, this is how you could steal from this company. And I'll tell my wife, and she thinks I'm kind of demented. And I'm like, this person could do that, and they could do this, they could do this. I always think, how would I steal from this company if I wanted to steal from this company, right? As a matter of fact, companies have hired former thieves to come advise, right? Okay? You ever see that money? Uh, catch me if you can. Do you ever see that with Leo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks? That was a true life story about a guy who embezzled and stole and all this sort of stuff. Well, he's a consultant now, okay? He's a consultant now. So... Ask yourself for these scenarios, how would you steal if you wanted to? Okay, exercise 8-1, number one. What internal control procedures would you recommend in each of the following situations? A concession company has one employee who sells towels, coolers, and sunglasses at the beach. Each day, the employee is given enough towels, coolers, and sunglasses to last through the day and enough cash to make change. The money is kept in a box at the stand. Okay, first of all, how would you steal money if you wanted to steal money from this company? Hmm? Just take it out of the box. They're the only one there. Yeah, but chances are that box is locked. Hmm. I know how I would steal money. Anybody else have any thoughts, though? Just take towels. Take the supplies. You could do that. Charge more. Here's what you do. That's, what you do. That's probably what you steal most. I mean, there's a lot of people who are not going to go break into a locked box and steal money or run away with a bunch of towels, okay? But what they're going to do is this. This is, some, this is a little trick I used to use with my buddies when we used to go to the baseball game, is I would tell them, hey, who wants ice cream? And uh, they'd go, oh, and I said, I'll go get the ice cream. And so I'd go get the ice cream. I said, I'll tell you what you owe me after I get it. So the ice cream would actually cost like $3.50 for a big waffle cone. And so I'd buy it. And then I'd tell my buddies it cost five dollars. <laughs> they'd give me five dollars. So you know what I mean. But see, I rationalized it. I thought that's a dollar fifty commission for me going to get my friends the ice cream, right? So what would you do if you were this? I, I know what I would do. Let's say the shirts cost ten bucks. Okay. You see some rich Johnson County woman who you know is going to buy her grandkids anything that they want. I just tell her the shirts cost fifteen dollars pocket the extra five, right? Sound like a good idea? Now don't write these down. I'm always afraid I'm teaching my students how to steal. Okay, how would you prevent that? I think that's the biggest risk of a situation right there. How would you prevent that? Like barcodes. We have them all handheld. Okay, that's a good, good suggestion there. Now, Because at the beach you can't really do that. Much. Well, it, here at the beach it's hard to wheel around a uh, cash register, right? Okay. But they do actually have portable things now people can wear, right? You ever seen those? I think they have them at Sonic and stuff, don't they? Where it's like a cash register that actually prints out a receipt. So you could do a situation where you say, if we don't give you a receipt, your item is free. Okay. Two people, here's the problem with that. Number one, it's twice as expensive. You're probably paying two people for something that really only needs one person. And the other thing is this, is how long do those two people are walking around on the beach talking, catching up with each other, 
before they say, hey, I have an idea. Let me run this idea by you. You see, you see what I'm saying? So, um, good thought, but that's, that's the, the danger you run there. Jake. Just the signs behind them that the owner makes that set the prices, because yeah. you're probably not going to go out and change the signs. Right. That's good, good, good idea. Good idea, Jake. What he's saying is make the sign at the stand that pretty prominent. T-shirts will be sold for $10, you know, sunglasses will be sold for $8 or whatever. One of my students brought up a good suggestion once. She said, maybe you make the T-shirt that the, that the people wear, that your employees wear, have the menu on the back, okay? So that you can tell if they're showing the menu, and so that's kind of advertising the menu as they walk around. You see what I'm saying? Tag each product as well. Now, definitely you want to have a situation where when you give an employee some merchandise and some cash to make change, and they go out for the, the morning and then come back, when they come back, they need to either have merchandise or the amount of money for that merchandise, right? And that all needs to be reconciled. So certainly they need to have that. Does that make sense? Okay. I think those are probably the main ways here. Any other thoughts on that? You check, so, like, you could check on them, like, pay people to go and... Very good idea. Very good idea, Matt. What he's saying is do checks on them. That's independent reviews, isn't it? So you might, every now and then, especially if you know somebody who's coming to the beach, say, hey, do me a favor. Uh, if you buy something from my employee today, don't tell them you know me, but I just, just tell me how much they charge and kind of the way they do things. Okay? Secret shopper sort of a thing. Right? Good idea. Okay, next one. An antique store has one employee who is given cash and sent to garage sales each weekend. The employee pays cash for any merchandise acquired that the antique store resells. Okay? How would you steal from this company? Here we're not selling stuff, we're buying stuff. How, how would you steal from this company? Oh. Well, you could just like take the cash again. So I, was in, I wrote down that if you use like a company credit card, then you could see all the purchases and stuff. Yeah, you could. Once again, you could just steal the cash. Is it, you know, mark up the price that you bought it for. Here's the deal, though. If you steal cash or you steal items, you can pretty much do it once, right? Like at the, like at the beach thing, if I want to steal sunglasses and with towels and just abscond with a bunch of stuff. Well, I've done that, but I can't come back to work the next day, right? So that's almost one of those situations where if that happens, it's a bummer, but it's not going to probably put you under. What we're more concerned about is that there's some way that people can steal hundreds and hundreds of dollars on an ongoing basis. Okay? Now that being said, antique dealer, how might you have an ongoing situation where you're losing money? I know one. Well, I would, um, I would give them a checkbook or something. Just, prov just stop them using cash all the time, because cash is hard to. Okay, now there's a challenge here, because most garage sales take cash, right? Some don't even take checks. Okay. Sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah, because garage sales are kind of cash, right? Sometimes you can write a check. They're not going to take debit card or anything like this. Now, what I would do is this. Let's say I saw an antique table that I knew my employer would be thrilled if I could buy it for a hundred bucks. And let's say she's only asking 40 bucks for it. Well, I could just say, if I was using cash, I could just say it cost a hundred dollars, pay the 40 and keep the 60. My employer thinks he spent, he spent a hundred on that table. What he actually did was spend 40 on that table and he gave me 60 dollars without knowing it. You see what I'm saying? That's the risk we have here. Now, how do we try to prevent that? if we can't write checks or can't use credit cards. We're just using cash. Get a receipt. Get a receipt, which is good. It has its challenges, though. But people... Because if you... Hold on. If you get a receipt from a garage sale, what's it going to be? Just handwritten. handwritten. Yeah, something written on a post-it note. I could have a friend falsify receipts all afternoon long, right? Where I could do it myself. So that's kind of tough. You can have a log of where they went, like addresses or something. And check on them. Yeah, you could do that, especially for more expensive items. 
or you could have some sort of, of uh, form that needs to be filled out real quick. And I think independent reviews is probably the best thing that you need to do there, is somehow check up on them. Again, hiring two people, it's not going to be long before they become really good buddies. And I think you're going to be in the same situation as if you just had one person out there. Um, you know, you could try to do this. You could try to say, put some money down and then go get a cashier's check or something like that. You know what I mean? That some people might accept. Different ways of maybe handling this. Jake? Maybe your company can uh, send you out with like a booklet of invoices. Like yeah. just blank invoices and you just yeah, fill them out. Yeah, so that they fill out. Yeah. Yeah. And you could even ask for their phone number and just say, can I, I need to call and verify some of these. And then you could call later and say, hey, my uh, employee bought a, a, your antique table at your garage sale today. And he says he paid 100 bucks. Is that, in fact, what he paid? And some people, you know, you at least want to, you at least want the situation there where there's the potential to be caught. Do you see what I'm saying? If there is zero checks and balances on this person, there's a lot more chance they're going to do it than even if there's a small chance. Because there are, there are people in this world who will not do things because they're afraid they will get caught or that it is illegal. We, didn't I ask last week how many have stolen a CD from Best Buy versus how many have burned a CD illegally for a friend? What's the difference? Chance of being caught. There are also things in the world that people don't do. Not all people don't do, but some people don't do because it's illegal. I do know, believe it or not, I do know college students who don't drink when they're underage just because it's against the law. Believe this or not, these, these people exist, and there's not just three or four of them. There are college students who don't drink because they're underage, and they're, they're like, you know, I don't want to worry about getting caught. I don't, want to, I don't want the whole deal. I think that this is why I'm always against the legalization of marijuana. I believe that there's people who don't smoke marijuana because it's illegal, and they don't want to, they're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be applying for jobs. I don't need this worry in my life. The, the, the benefits don't outweigh the costs. You see what I'm saying? There are people like that. I was kind of like that as a, I was kind of like that as a kid. There's things I just didn't do because they're illegal and I just, I was always the one who got caught and I didn't want to get caught. Okay? Except for the Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. I told you about that sordid incident, right? Okay, good discussion on this. Let's, let's jump towards the other one real quick. Um, was it exercise 8-2? Okay, this is, this is a situation that's in a lot of news stories, very similar to it. Uh, Cantu Company is a rapidly growing startup business. Its record keeper, who was hired nine months ago, left town after the company's manager discovered that a large sum of money had disappeared over the past three months. An audit disclosed that the record keeper had written and signed several che checks made payable to her fiancé and then recorded the checks as salaries expense. The fiancé, who cashed the checks but never worked for the company, left town with the record keeper. As a result, the company incurred an uninsured loss of 84000 Evaluate their internal control system and indicate which principles were ignored. What do you think? Which ones were ignored? <coughs> insured assets and bond key employees. Okay. They didn't insure their assets or bond key employees because it says they lost all the money. Okay? Good. What else? Separation of tasks. Separation of tasks or separate record keeping from separate record keeping from custody of assets? Yep. She had she had both responsibilities, right? And if I would have gone in there four months ago and told them you shouldn't give her both of these responsibilities, what would they have told me? She's the nicest girl in the world. We don't have to worry about her. She's great. She's getting married. Her fiance seems like a nice guy too. He's always in a really good mood. Okay. Um, okay. So that good. Anything else? One other thing I'd probably add is they don't. It didn't seem like they were doing independent reviews. Okay. One thing you should always check for is if you do your own payroll. 
you as the owner of a company should always go through your payroll checks to see who these checks are written to to make sure they're actual employees. Okay? All right. And um, because if he's like, why are we paying this lady's fiance $1,500 every week? Okay? That's a, common, that's a common way to steal from a company, is make up a fictitious employee. Okay? And they get paid every week. And they're not doing anything. Okay? All right, so there was a number of principles that were violated here. Any others that you can think of? But no doubt they didn't feel like they needed an internal control structure in place because their, their employees were all wonderful uh, people full of integrity and character. Okay? So you need to have these things in place. Okay? All right, let's go to a little lecture here. Go back to the PowerPoints if there's no other comments. I want to talk a little bit about the control of cash. Now, why do we talk about cash in the internal control chapter? Well, it's because the more liquid something is, the more it is, the more people want to steal it. And cash is the most liquid of all. This is why we talked about casinos having such strong internal control structures. They understand this. Because there's cash everywhere, isn't there? It's very liquid. A poker chip is extremely liquid. Okay? Now, you want to separate your handling of cash from your record keeping of cash. What does this mean? Well, this means the person who writes checks and signs checks should not be the people who have access over the complete general ledger. Or they can write themselves a check and adjust it out. Cash receipts should be promptly deposited in a bank. You ever work at a restaurant and you go like, where's Mary? Well, she ran the deposit to the bank. You ever been there? Okay. Yeah, you want to get that money in a bank. Okay. So it's not susceptible to throttle to fraud. You make your disbursements by check, right? You don't just stick a bunch of $20 bills in an envelope to pay your bills, right? But you use a check, okay? Um, now when we talk about cash, we're not just talking about dollar bills and coins, but we're talking about access to checking accounts, access to savings accounts. I would put poker chips up here as well. Are poker chips cash? No but they pretty much can be treated as what we're going to talk about in a second, a cash equivalent almost. But this is any access to the company's cash, even if it's by check or credit card or debit card or whatever. Cash equivalents are those things that technically are not cash, but they're short term and they're so liquid that we almost treat them as a cash equivalent. Such as like a 90 day certificate of deposit. But the, we, we know what these things are worth cash-wise, and if it's an investment, they're so close to maturity date that they're not even sensitive, sensitive to any interest rate changes that might occur. So we want to protect our cash and our cash equivalents. Okay, over-the-counter cash receipts. Again, we talked about you want to have a cash register with a locked-in record of your transactions, correct? If, you don't, if we don't give you a receipt, your meal is free. Okay, that's their, their, uh, um, that's their attempt to get everything in the cash register with a locked-in record. You want to compare the cash register record at the end of the day with the cash that's in there, right? This is called a reconciliation of the cash uh, drawer or the cash register. Okay? Bank tellers have to do this at the end of each shift. What if you get cash receipts by mail? Again, meaning mostly checks. Okay, people don't send cash in the mail, but getting checks in the mail. Well, you want to have se you want to separate re uh, the responsibilities. Maybe have two people open the mail. Okay, you give the money to the cashier's office and you give the list to the accounting department, so that the same person doesn't have custody and record keeping. Okay. What about disbursements? Again, you make your disbursements by check. And we'll talk about the exception here for petty cash in a minute. You want to separate authorization for check signing from record keeping. Once again, a lot of times the owner of the company is the only one who can sign a check. But so many times, here's what happens. The owner gets lazy and just thinks, you know what, Barbara, I'm going to put you on the checking account. This is crazy. 
because I'm always gone golfing, or and and I trust you. You've been here three years. You seem like a great woman. I'm going to go ahead and give you check signing capability, and that is the beginning of the end. Because now you've given the person who has record keeping uh, responsibilities custody of the assets, checks, and they start writing themselves checks. Okay, don't do that. Talks about a voucher system. What is a voucher system? Well, a voucher system is the, the policies and procedures in place for making cash disbursements. Um, here is an example coming off the PowerPoints. Let's say that you guys are employees at my company. Let's say you need a new computer for you. You're an employee of mine and you need a new computer. Well, you fill out a request. I, the owner, approve that request. And so I give it to my purchasing department, Matt, okay? He purchases it, and when the computer comes in, it comes in to you, and you fill out a receiving report that this computer was received, right? Mm -hmm. Kim, you then install it and sign a piece of paper that said this was installed in her office, okay? Then, when the invoice comes in, you're my accountant, Allie, you take all these documents, the purchase request, the receiving report, etc., make sure that they all are aligned together, and you prepare the check to be paid and staple it all together. And then you give it to me to sign, and I look through it and make sure it all looks good. That's like a voucher system. You see what I'm saying? Authorizations, signings, keeping those documents. This next slide gives you a lot of uh, examples of things you might find in a voucher system. Invoice approvals, receiving reports, purchase orders, purchase requests. Even the check itself is, is part of the validation of that payment. Okay? So when you make cash payments, you, want, you go through this process. Now this process can take a little while, can't it? So that is why we have something called a petty cash system of control, okay? Let's say, again, you guys are employees at my company, and let's say all of a sudden you need to print out a report that you're going to give a client that you're going to meet in a couple hours, and we are out of printer cartridges, and the printer doesn't have any ink. So we don't want to go through this process well, everybody has to do this, right? Because that takes a while, right? So what a petty cash fund is, is usually like a little metal box where you keep like $500 cash that you can go make a quick purchase with. Does anybody, anybody ever worked where they have something like that? It's very common, okay? And now certainly if you say, okay, I got go to I gotta go to Office Max and get some printer cartridges. Okay, let me give you some money out of the cash, petty cash fund. Now, and I give you a couple hundred dollars to buy, you know, five or six of them. Well, certainly, what am I going to want you to bring back? A receipt. A receipt. Okay? Now, what's the worst that can happen if I have a $500 petty cash fund? Somebody could steal all $500. That's a bummer, but you're probably not going to go under. Okay? But you have to have a means like this where people can make a quick purchase. Because the voucher system, while that is the preferred method, Sometimes it doesn't make sense because you need some money right now to do something. Okay? Make sense? Here's the way this works, though, on a simple basis. Okay? Let's say this is my petty cash box. Okay? Yeah, let me back that up. This is my petty cash box. I'm not a very good artist. Okay? Not a very good. Okay. Well, if I start out with $500 cash and there's no receipts, well, let's, go, let's say you go spend $150 um, on printer cartridges, right? And then you put the change back in the box. Well, at that point, there's only $350 worth of cash, right? But there's also a receipt for $150, right? The, the, the receipts plus the cash always should equal $500, okay? Then let's say you go buy some pizza for the company party and you spend $50. Well, now we only have $300 cash, right? But we better have another receipt 
for fifty dollars. You see what I'm saying? That adds up to five hundred. Now, some at some point you have to replenish this little box, don't you? Okay. Let's talk about the petty cash a little bit more. Again, this is for small payments for postage, courier fees, repairs, supplies. What you do, uh, how do you set this up? Well, you decide an amount you want to set up as your petty cash fund. You write a check and you make this journal entry right here to establish the fund. You, they set theirs up for $400. So you debit petty cash for $400 and you credit cash for 400 because you took, you took cash out of your checking account or whatever. You, so you're decreasing your cash and you're putting $400 in your petty cash fund, right? And you put it in a little lockbox or whatever, okay? Now you pay different people things like you bought some stamps for $45 or you paid a courier for delivery, you paid $80, okay? And you get receipts for those, right? You get a receipt, um, and if there's a if there's a lack of receipts or that it's not proper receipts, it's people could be stealing from you. Okay, but you want to try to get valid receipts for that. Now, at some point, you have to replenish the account. You have to replenish the petty cash. Okay. Now let me talk about how, how you do that. Um, I like the next slide better. Okay, let's take a look at this example. Tension Company maintains a petty cash fund of $400. So when they set up this petty cash fund, they debited petty cash for $400 and they credited cash for $400. Some time goes by and it's time to replenish this fund. Now we find the following information in there. Let's say that these are our receipts, okay? Let's say this information right here is our receipts, okay? Now there's also still some cash in there. There's not 400, but there is $137.80, okay? See so with me? We open up this metal box, there's four receipts, and there's 137.80. Now it's time to replenish it. Well, the first question I always ask is, if I want to have $400 in there, which is what we set it up for, and we only have $137.80, how much more cash do I have to put, it in, put in that box to bring it back up to $400? And in this case, the, exam, the answer is $262.20. Does that make sense? Now, here's how you do the journal entry. And I like to think of it as in steps. Do these three steps and you won't make a mistake. If you don't do, even when I don't do these three steps in the order I'm giving them to you, that's when a mistake is made by me. The first thing you do is credit cash. You don't credit petty cash. You credit cash. For the amount of money you need to put in the box to bring it up to its original amount. Now we had 137.80, correct? So we have to go to the bank and get 262.20 out of the cash account and put it in this box to bring it up to $400. That's the first thing you do. The second thing you do, where's my pointer? The second thing you do is you go through those receipts and you record them in your books. So for the travel expense receipt, you, you debit travel expense. If there was something for entertainment for $93.42, you debit entertainment expense for $93.42. Postage expense for $55, you debit that. Office supplies expense, you debit that. So that's the second step is you just, just picture yourself going through these receipts and recording each one in the proper account that they should go in. Usually an expense account is debited. That's the second step. So we got the first step, we got the second step. The third step then, the third step is, if necessary, if the journal entry doesn't balance, you're going to, to, to either debit or credit this account called cash over and short. Now here we were short $2. 
okay? We were short $2 in the petty cash fund. Now, are you going to go ballistic over $2? Probably not, okay? May have, been, may have just been a mistake. But you're going to either debit or credit cash over and short for whatever you have to to make this journal entry balance. That's your third and final step. Now, cash over and short is an income statement account, and it can have, an in, it can have a debit balance or a credit balance. If you are short cash, it has a debit balance, like an expense, and that was the, that's the situation here. You can have more cash in than you were supposed to, and there we would credit cash over and short. Do you think you usually have a debit balance in your cash over and short or a credit balance? A debit. Because usually if you give out too much change to somebody, they're not going to say anything, right? But um, if you give out too little, they'll tell you. You shorted them. Does that make sense? Okay. So those are the steps to replenish the cash fund. When you do your homework tonight, I want you to do those three steps when it's time to replenish your petty cash fund. How much cash do I have to put in there to bring it up to the desired amount is the first step. The second step is you go through those receipts and you record them in the proper accounts. And the third step is you debit or credit cash over and short for whatever you have to to make that journal entry balance. And if that account doesn't have a very large balance, you're probably just not going to worry about it. It's a cost-benefit sort of a deal, okay? Okay, now read a little bit about petty cash in your book. Um, I would have liked to uh, talk about it maybe a little bit more, but you can read about petty cash. It's on page 326 through 328 in your books, okay? So you can read about that, but why don't you go ahead and do... Um, let me write your homework down. And I'll put it up here on the overhead for you to do. All right. Um, go ahead and do them in this order as well. Go ahead and do quick study 8.4 and exercise 8.6 and exercise 8.5. You with me? All right. See you guys next time.